You suck at solidity unless you know these 30 tricks. From best practice to gas optimization and security, I will give you all my best secrets. Hey, I'm curious. You know how to debug JavaScript like a pro, right? I mean, you use console log all over, right? What if you could bring the same level of advanced debugging skills to Solidity? Turns out, you can do it. Here is a Solidity smart contract in Remix. And I have absolutely no idea what is the value of these two variables. But with console log, we gotta figure it out. You just need to import console log. And after, you can litter your code with as many console log as you want. And when you execute this function, you will see your console log in the Remix terminal. Freaking awesome! But wait, are you one of these Solidity developers who use Pragma Statement like this? You are doing it wrong! If you do this, any Solidity compiler starting with 0.8 can compile your smart contract. 0.8.1, 0.8.2, etc. It's super dangerous! And unfortunately, we see this in many tutorials. Not mine, of course. Mm -hmm. Instead, you should specify exactly the version of Solidity, like this. And that's it. Okay, the next trick is super useful. Have you stumbled upon the error stack too deep? That's what she said. Yes, Solidity is a she. And she really doesn't like it when there are too many variables in a function. The limit is between 16 to 17 depending on the function. And when this happens, you will see the cryptic error message stack too deep error. But fortunately, you can get rid of it with this one simple trick. You just have to wrap your variables in a struct. And that's it. The next trick is for your smart contract is getting too big. EIP-170 introduced a limit of 24 kilobytes for the code size of a smart contract, which is between 300 to 500 lines of Solidity code. An easy fix is to split your smart contract into several contracts. Problem solved. The next trick is when you want to reuse the same struct in different files. Do you have to redefine the same struct several times? Wrong answer. The right way to do it is to declare a struct in another file outside of any contract definition. Yes, it's possible to do that. And after, you can import this file from any smart contract, which allow you to reference the struct. Beautiful. The next trick is very similar, but for functions. If there is a function that you want to reuse in several files, you can use the same technique. You declare the function in a file outside of a contract. Technically, this is called a free function. And you import this file in a smart contract and you can use all the functions that were imported. Easy. The next trick is about percentages in Solidity. There were so many hacks that were due to this, so pay attention. In JavaScript, we have decimal numbers. If you try to divide 90 by 100, JavaScript will give you 0.9. But in Solidity, we only have integers. So when you divide 90 by 100 in Solidity, the result will be rounded down to the nearest integer. So 90 divided by 100 is zero, not 0 0.9 and 110 divided by 100 is 1, not 1.1. And for financial application, this is a disaster. To solve this problem, you can multiply the whole operation by an arbitrary big number, and then you will divide the result by the same number later. And many DeFi protocols use this trick. The next trick is for reading state variables. State variable is a variable declared at the contract level and this is stored in the blockchain. When you want to return the value of a variable, you might be tempted to create a function for that. But that's not needed because in Solidity, when you make a variable public, it automatically creates a getter function of the same name. The next trick is for instantiating nested mappings. Let's say we have this nested mapping. You cannot instantiate the nested mapping in memory and then put it inside the outer mapping. Instead, you have to specify the keys of the outer and inner mappings and you assign a value directly. It's the same notation as a two-dimensional array. Now, what if instead of a nested mapping, you have a nested array? For example, an array inside of a mapping. This time you specify the key of the mapping and you use the push function to add elements to the array. Okay, so for the next trick, I'm gonna show you how you can return all the elements of an array. If you declare an array as public, it will create a getter function, but this getter function only returns one specific element, not the whole array. To get the whole array, all you have to do is create a function with the proper signature and a return statement that returns the array. The next trick is about iterating over a mapping. I'm sorry, in Solidity, you can do it. This is not like in JavaScript, but with this trick, there is a workaround. All you have to do is choose predictable keys, like consecutive integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And every time you create a new entry, you have to track what is the next key, 
And with this, to iterate over a mapping, all you have to do is a for loop where you go between zero and last key. Okay, so now you can iterate over a mapping, but what if you want to return it? You will need another trick. For that, you will create an array in memory. Then in a for loop, you copy each element of the mapping in the array. Then you return the array. Et voila! The next trick is about unbounded loop. If you execute a transaction, it should never have an unbounded loop. Unbounded meaning that you don't know in advance the number of iterations. And that's because if the number of iterations is getting bigger and bigger, the transaction will get more and more expensive, and at some point it will become impossible to execute it because the gas cost will exceed the block gas limit, which is the maximum gas cost that you can have in a transaction. Next, I'm going to give you a few tricks about smart contract security. Smart contract security is super important, so pay attention. The first trick is to apply the principle of least privilege in your functions. That means that in order to reduce the surface areas of potential attacks, you want to restrict the visibility of your functions as much as possible. For example, if a function is only called from inside a smart contract, make it internal. If a function is only called from outside a smart contract, make it external. And finally, if it can be called both inside and outside of the contract, make it public. My next trick is about access control. If a function should only be accessed by a certain address, make sure you enforce this rule with a required statement or a custom error. My next trick is to never trust external values. Always assume that other people will try to screw you, either by sending the wrong input by accident, or worse, by deliberately trying to hack your smart contract. And to protect against this, in your sensitive function, always use either required statements or custom errors to check the value provided as arguments. My next trick is to protect yourself from re-entrancy attacks. So many protocols were destroyed by this. The idea is that you have to be very careful when you call another smart contract from your Solidity code. Reentrancy attack is when your smart contract call another smart contract and that this other smart contract calls back your smart contract. Yes, it's possible. This can create an execution pass that you didn't anticipate and in some cases the attacker can manage to steal money from your smart contract. And to protect against this, the most simple solution is to do a re-entrancy guard. So at the contract level, you define a boolean flag. So this is going to be a global state that will persist between the re-entrant calls. And in the function that calls the other smart contract before the call, you throw an error. If the flag is true, then you set the flag to true. And after the call, you set the flag to false. So if the other smart contract is trying to do a reentrancy attack, it's going to be blocked by this line. Okay, so next we're going to talk of tricks to optimize gas. And I'm going to start with the Solidity Optimizer. Did you know that Solidity was super lazy? That's true. When you compile a Solidity smart contract, the Solidity compiler turns your Solidity code into EVM bytecode. That's what the Ethereum virtual machine can understand. By default, Solidity creates an unoptimized EVM bytecode. And when you are developing a smart contract, it's actually what you want. Because all you care about is fast compilation time. But when you deploy a smart contract in production, this time you don't care about compilation time. All you want is a very optimized code that is gas efficient. In Remix, to turn on the Solidity Optimizer, you go to the Compiler tab, then Advanced Settings, you tick Enable Optimization, and you can put any number between 0 and 2 power 64 minus 1. Yes, that's a very big number. The lower the number, the more you optimize for deployment cost, the higher the number, the more you optimize for execution cost. Every time you deploy to production, you should use the Solidity Optimizer. The next trick is about events. Both state variables and events can store values. However, events consume less gas. The only downside of events is that we can read them from a smart contract. It's only for outside consumers. So that means that if you have some variables that will just be consumed outside the smart contracts, but don't need to be read by the smart contract, just use events. Another trick about events is to not include timestamps in them. Timestamps are already included by default in the log of events when they are emitted. Having them as a field in the event is redundant and just wastes some gas. So don't do it. For the next trick, I'm going to show you how to save some gas with the uncheck keyword. When you do arithmetic operations like addition, this can result in overflow or underflow. Overflow is when a number goes beyond the maximum value that can be represented and goes back on the other side of the range. And underflow is the contrary. 
Usually this is not a desired behavior. When an overflow or underflow happen, Solidity is going to trigger an error. While this check is very useful, it also consumes more gas. If you are 100% sure that there won't be an overflow or underflow, you can wrap your code with the uncheck keyword to disable the overflow underflow check. The next trick is about caching values in the stack. In Solidity, there are different memory locations. The storage is long-term memory in the blockchain. This is where variables declared at the contract level are stored. And the stack is a short-term memory. This is where you will find local variables defined in functions. Reading the storage is more expensive than reading the stack. That's why in some situations, it can make sense to catch some value from the storage in the stack. For example, if you are looping over an array, instead of rereading the length of the array for every pass, you can catch the length of the array before the for loop. The next trick is also about memory locations. Another memory location is call data. This is the data field of the transaction where you will find the arguments of the function. Another memory location is memory, which is a temporary data location for complex data structures like arrays. If you provide an array as an argument to an external function, if you just read the array and you don't modify it, use the call data keyword instead of the memory keyword because when you use the memory keyword, internally Solidity copies the array from call data to memory and it costs more gas. The next trick is to use the constant keyword. If you define a constant value that never change, don't define this value like this because you are wasting gas. Instead, you should use the constant keyword. The next trick is to use the pure keyword. If you create a function that returns a constant value that never change and that you don't read from the storage, instead of the view keyword, use the pure keyword. It's going to save you some gas. My next trick is to use mapping instead of arrays. Whenever you want to represent a data collection, arrays can seem like the best solution, but arrays are more expensive than mappings and they are also more limited than JavaScript arrays. So in most cases, mappings are a better solution. The next trick is about variable packing. The storage in the Ethereum virtual machine is divided in slots of 256 bits. By default, simple variable types like uin take one slot. However, some variable types don't need 256 bits. For example, a uint 128 only needs 128 bits. So in theory, we could pack two uint 128 in a single storage slot. And the good news is that Solidity does this optimization in some cases. All you have to do is group the variables that can be packed in your variable declaration. And Solidity will pack them in the same slot. Another trick is bitmaps. This is useful if you want to save some gas with Boolean values. In Solidity, a Boolean variable takes one full slot of 256 bits. But actually, a Boolean value only needs one bit. So in theory, we could store 256 Boolean values in a single slot. And we can do this with bitmaps. The idea is that when we read or write a Boolean value, we just interact with one bit, not the whole slot. Here's how it works. First, let's do the writing operation. There are two cases. When we want to set the bit to one, and when we want to set it to zero. So first, when we want to set it to one, we will use what's called a bit mask where there is only one bit set to zero. And to control which bit, we use the bit shift operator, which shifts a series of bits by a certain offset. This is the symbol for the left shift. So for example, if we shift this number by two, it will become this. And after we use the bit or operation, we does an or operation bit by bit. It means that we'll only change the bit that we're interested in. All the other ones won't change. Okay, so that was for setting the bit to one. And in the other case, when we want to set the bit to zero, it's a bit complex, so I'll let you figure it out on your own. And for reading the bit, all we have to do is to create a bit mask where only the bit we want to read is set to one. And after we do a bit n operation, and we can test that everything works fine. Let's set the second bit to true, we read it, and it's equal to four because two power two equal four. And after, if we set it to zero, we reread it, and this time it's back to zero. So it's working. And my last trick is to use Solidity Assembly, also called YOL, when you want to have a maximum flexibility. YOL is a low-level language that can be used in Solidity smart contracts. Since it's a low-level language, it can use some EVM opcodes that are not available in Solidity. It also allows for certain gas optimizations that aren't possible in Solidity. 
but you always have to keep in mind that it's easier to introduce some bugs in YOL, so only use it if absolutely required. But there is something else that you need to understand about YOL. Mastering YOL is one of the best ways to demonstrate your expertise in the EVM. But very few people know how to program in YOL. If you can become one of the few people that master YOL, it's going to be a major boost for your career and it's going to be way easier to find a solidity job. And if you want to take that pass, next you should watch this other video on my channel where we will rewrite a solidity smart contract into YOL. You are going to learn so much. This stuff is awesome. That's it for now. See you next time. Bye.